Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, first webinar of the year by TPA. Uh, we have a very uh, interesting uh, topic and uh, certainly I'm, I'm very proud to uh, uh, announce the presence of uh, Professor uh, Bomer of the University of Amsterdam and uh, Dr. Knut Olsen uh, from Norway, who are, um, um, as they will introduce themselves, uh, who are tax and technology expert uh, and, and, uh, in the case of Albert and uh, transfer pricing and anti-corruption specialist in the case of Knut. Um, so we we are going to um, to set the scene. We're going to talk about uh, if you analyze a value chain, uh, how would that look like for tax and how would that look like for anti-corruption and how do the two stack up uh, to make it uh, very illustrative for uh, for the audience. Uh, um, Professor Bomer will uh, will talk about Mozambique in a specific case on anti-corruption with a lot of side shoots into the tax arena. And uh, Dr. Olson uh, Knut will uh, will address the Rolls-Royce case, which, uh, which is a, a famous case. Uh, before we start, I would like to um, assure people uh, that all the information we've been uh, sharing with you is in the public domain and, and serves as an illustration on the case only and is not there intended to uh, damage any any position of anyone involved in the, in these cases. So with that, I would like to um, um, start the presentation and go to the next slide. So in, in setting the scene, I took uh, the liberty of saying, okay, if we do forensic accounting on tax transfer pricing related issues, what is the best data set we can go to? Um, and, and I'm now talking from a, a, a tax authority's perspective. I would then go to the CBCR um, data, the country by country data collected by uh, governments. Um, the IRS published a tool on a lot of uh, country by co country data, uh, which was uh, uh, filed with the IRS by um, US multinationals uh, who are predominantly headquartered in the US. And, and uh, the, the data set, if you put a forensic accounting pair of glasses on, uh, looks a little bit like this uh, slide. So what you see is of the U.S. headquarter companies, uh, the, the non-U.S. income um, reported in these uh, country by country reports is 13.3 percent uh, in in a place like Bermuda, BVI, and Cayman. Um, that that obviously is uh, taxed at a very low tax rate of 1.3 percent, uh, as this uh, table shows. While on the other end of the table, you do see um, only 1.3% of the non-US income by these US headquarter companies was reported in Germany, where Germany has an effective tax rate of 33.3%. If we move to the next slide, and again, this is setting the scene for the two cases coming up. Uh, this is the, the other way of looking at the same data. So if you, if you have one, trillion of total international income reported outside the US. And this is again using this uh, IRS published uh, country by country data. Then uh, what you see is that 18% of that income is uh, is reported as in, in stateless entities in other countries. 20% is uh, reported in tax haven countries. And um, 27% is reported in tax favored uh, uh, countries, uh, all, all with an effective tax rate, which is fairly fairly low, as you see from uh, the, the reporting in Form 8975. Uh, so that, in essence, means there's a, a huge portion of, uh, of uh, non-US income which doesn't land in, in the regular tax regime. Uh, based on these uh, these numbers, uh, it it puts a little bit also the uh, the, the preference of the U.S. government for uh, for um, a pillar two discussion in the, in another perspective. So this is uh, how data uh, currently still undisclosed or anonymized, as we see. This is an IRS data set, but obviously 
fully anonymized, um, so we don't know which multinationals are behind the scene uh, in, in, the, in this setup. And as we know, a lot of the rules of the game changed since then, uh, including the 2017 US tax reforms and uh, the, the recent reforms we're looking at uh, under the Biden administration. So uh, no, no direct conclusions, but it's clear a lot of data delivers a lot of information and a lot of interesting insights. If we take the next slide, then uh, what what we see happening is, and this is an EU initiative, uh, the EU last um, last year in September decided to uh, move to a, a public country by country re reporting. That means as of 20, the year 2023. Uh, companies with, with a sales value in excess of 750 million will need to put additional information on their website, which means the anonymization of CPCR data becomes less anonymous, as we know from already the banking and the insurance industry who, uh, who on a mandatory basis report these uh, country by country data points already on their website. So this is the forensic accounting hat uh, from a tax professional on. Um, I think uh, now it's a good time to shift gears and give the floor to uh, to Knut Olsen. Knut, can I uh, hand over the floor to you? Can I give you the floor for the Rolls-Royce case? Oh, uh, one, one step back, sorry. Knut, I forgot one important slide. So if we look at value chain analysis and the CBCR as the, the most extensive data set you do value chain analysis on uh, at the level of the tax authorities, which is the first line, uh, can you use, that's the one of the big questions we're, we're looking into right now, can you use the same data set or do you need more data to look in, into the same value chain with the same data or some extra data to also uh, make an assessment on anti-corruption law being complied with or not? Uh, that, that, for example, if you have stickers on the value chain uh, which uh, do not disclose bribery but instead uh, have a reported sales commission, that could be an indication. Uh, Anti-corruption plays law and legislation plays a role in that uh, uh, value chain. Uh, if, for example, and that's the next uh, line, if uh, operating margins are generously high, uh, as high as 25% operating margin or even higher, uh, would that be a case uh, of antitrust? Well, the answer is not in all cases. Uh, and even if I look at undisclosed source of services and products uh, and, and or labor, would I be uh, uh, looking at another set of law references, in this case, the breach of human rights. So, so here is a, a real widening of, uh, if I'm looking at forensic accounting on a data set, suddenly I can use one data set and expand it a little bit to, to also make an assessment on, uh, on other references of law. Um, today, we will, uh, we will also only focus ourselves on the first uh, two. Um, with that, uh, Knut, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, okay. I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Knut Olsen, and I'm in short uh, the tax advisor, uh, global tax advisor. Um, and also a chartered anti-corruption uh, advisor, and uh, I'm working with um, the international uh, <coughs> business in uh, taxation, and uh, I'm also supporting uh, large uh, corporations on uh, ISO certification on uh, anti-corruption. Uh, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Can you speak up a little bit louder? I, 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 you, your voice uh, at my end is fairly low. So if you can speak up a little bit, then it might be easier for everyone. Is it better now? 
that's a lot better. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Good. <laughs> yes, I said I'm also doing, in addition to international uh, tax advising, I'm also dealing with um, <laughs> anti-corruption and I'm supporting uh, corporations on building up uh, anti-corruption uh, corruption systems and uh, <laughs> protecting the company for uh, corruptions. And, uh, Further, I'm also an ISO auditor on anti-corruption and uh, do certification on behalf of uh, large corporations on uh, anti-corruption. So, uh, next, I will talk about the Rolls-Royce case, which was uh, raised a few years ago in the UK. And, um, I think this is a quite interesting uh, case uh, because it shows uh, how bad it might uh, go and it also shows uh, that uh, the authorities is uh, doing whatever they can to stop uh, <coughs> corruptions uh, and this was a case which was on uh, the Crown Court in UK and it was raised by the Serious Fraud Office SFO. Uh, next. Uh, first, uh, <coughs> corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain and it often includes uh, multiple offences like um, false accounting, tax evasion, failure of corporate governance, set up design to prevent investigation, planning on anti-corruption, and the offense of bribery. I have seen lots of anti-corruption cases and I haven't seen any cases where the companies are uh, <coughs> breaching anti-corruption law and uh, still be compliance on uh, taxation. If uh, the company or the corporations is uh, <coughs> have done uh, cor <coughs> corruption, it's uh, normally also that they have uh, completed uh, tax evasion uh, by doing false accounting or uh, uh, other offenses, but um, it might be possible to be compliant on tax if a company have done uh, corruptions, but um, I think it's uh, seldom that uh, that will be the case uh, if there is a bribery or a corruption case. Uh, next, please. Uh, there are different uh, legislation both in uh, Europe and uh, also in uh, different countries uh, and um, uh, one of the a <coughs> few of the legislation in Europe is the Treaty on Functioning of uh, European Union and um, according to this uh, treaty corruption is recognized as a euro crime and therefore uh, European Union, they hold uh, legislation and they do uh, lots of uh, work to com uh, <coughs> combat with uh, corruptions. It is also a convention on fighting on corruptions in uh, European Union and um, uh, organizations like OECD and uh, UN are uh, doing a great work on uh, anti-corruption. So there are lots of documentations, uh, conventions, uh, agreement. Uh, uh, and also the <coughs> UK was uh, quite early with the new Bribery Act and the, the UK Bribery Act is uh, more or less used in many other countries around the world because the, this act is very thorough and detailed and it's a good tool to prevent um, corruption. Next please. Uh, as Steve said, this is no blame, no shame, uh, but uh, lessons learned and uh, I think this is a lesson that uh, many company corporations can learn from because um, in this case, uh, lots of uh, things went wrong and uh, this case was so uh, bad that it uh, could always have been game over for Rolls Royce uh, because the offender they had uh, completed. 
it was uh, bribery of foreign officials. Uh, it was uh, commercial bribery towards uh, other business companies, and it was uh, false accounting. <laughs> It was uh, carried out uh, in uh, many different uh, jurisdictions and uh, in different business areas in uh, Rolls-Royce. And it's, uh, what all, it was also confirmed from uh, 1989 to 2020, so it was a quite long period uh, where they abused uh, the legislation quite seriously, actually. And uh, part of the <coughs> offense was that they paid um, US uh, 35 million in bribe. And um, it is not uh, clear from the case, uh, the tax issue for this uh, bribe, but uh, I believe they, <coughs> they didn't uh, count for this uh, properly. So, but uh, anyway, they paid um, a large uh, sum in order to achieve uh, <coughs> profit uh, for their own company. Next, please. Uh, it was uh, involved uh, top management, uh, maybe not the CEO, but uh, it was quite uh, senior management who were uh, <clears throat> involved in this uh, corruption case. And uh, the SFO, they said that this was uh, the most serious breach on criminal law in UK in the areas of bribery and corruption. Uh, corruption is a little bit more extensive than bribery, uh, and which they also include uh, anti-money laundering, etc. Uh, the company failed to prevent uh, bribery. <laughs> they didn't have any uh, anti-corruption management uh, system in place, uh, which was implemented. Uh, they had some documentation, but uh, this was never used or never <coughs> updated or uh, uh, the documentation was not even uh, known by the employees. Uh, the SFO also said that uh, Rolls-Royce played a very leading role in uh, organization planning and uh, unlawful activity over a very long period. And uh, they abused their uh, position of trust uh, for the company. Uh, next, please. Uh, it was very careful corruption planning, and it was corruption planning uh, which they didn't want to be uh, recognized, or uh, uh, it was planning, so they shouldn't be able to be caught for it. So they, they tried to hide, hide it. Uh, during the investigation, they uh, <laughs> came to the value of 250 million gross profit was the gain they had had from the corruption case in the, the different countries for, <laughs> for the years they uh, performed this uh, corruption case. It was uh, substantial harm to cause by this conduct and uh, they also said uh, there was uh, close to no uh, training, internal training on anti-corruption. It was only sporadic and it was uh, very minimal uh, in the company. So uh, the, uh, the court and the SFO, they said, uh, called this uh, a disaster because it was quite a big effect, uh, effect on uh, the economic and uh, uh, for the company and also for the government. It was uh, many and uh, it was different attempts to do this misconduct mis uh, and um, uh, it was a quite, quite big case worldwide, uh, causing a lot of loss for the governments. Uh, next please. Uh, in favor of uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, the court and the SFO, they said, um, uh, when uh, Rolls-Royce was caught in this, they started uh, immediately with the uh, extraordinary cooperation with the SFO. And they did uh, whatever they could to uh, dismiss everything and to uh, disclose everything and to cooperate in all ways to, to get to the bottom of this uh, corruption case. So they didn't hold anything back. They, 
Uh, they gave all documentation. They uh, they were uh, very positive when the investigation started. They also spent uh, internal investigation for around 123 million uh, pound UK uh, pound. And this is a quite significant uh, amount and uh, the court said that uh, this will continue after the case was uh, closed. So, um, <clears throat> so this was a very big step for them to, to do this investigation and in order to find uh, all, uh, <coughs> all issues in this matter. Uh, they also had taken a very significant uh, steps on compliance and uh, cultural change uh, in uh, Rolls Royce, and um, uh, they moved from being a very bad company, didn't uh, on uh, lack of compliance, to be <coughs> maybe one of the best companies on uh, anti-corruption because they did they took this very seriously and they changed the uh, top management. They introduced uh, <coughs> anti-corruption uh, culture, they implemented um, a management system and uh, they, uh, they really did what they could to, uh, to end this uh, and uh, turn it around. Uh, the SFO also spent uh, 30 million on the case <coughs> and they preferred uh, settlement with Rolls Royce. Uh, next please. <coughs> The SFO office, they said that uh, it was a quite uh, big impact uh, of prosecution. And they said <coughs> conviction would affect the ability of Rolls Royce to trade in the world, um, maybe particularly in the United States, because they, they got the very strong uh, anti-corruption legislation. And um, uh, this would uh, cause uh, lots of problems for uh, Rolls Royce uh, for maybe 25 or 30 years uh, forwards. And they also said that uh, exclusion would have a significant uh, business uh, effect uh, on the financial position and also affect uh, uh, the negative LA effect uh, the share price negatively and impact uh, on the confidence of the shareholders and uh, the future strategy. And uh, they also said it was uh, additional consequences for third parties. And uh, another issue was actually that um, SFO, they, uh, they saw the risk in continuing in this investigation without having a settlement and uh, to take this to court because this could be <laughs> quite uh, time consuming, costly, and uh, even if uh, SFO had a quite strong case, they believe that they might lose or <laughs> the result might be uncertain, so they preferred um, a settlement rather than <laughs> taking the, the, the court uh, to the, uh, the case to the court. Next, please. Uh, uh, Knut, uh, Knut, a question from uh, from the audience. Uh, what what uh, do you know? What forensic uh, technique on data sets did uh, SFO apply to get all this uh, information on the on the table? Is there any yeah, discussion the, on that public case? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, the authorities and uh, the SFO, they didn't uh, investigate the Rolls Royce. Uh, they didn't have any uh, suspect uh, on it and they didn't, they were not aware of any wrongdoing in Rolls Royce, but they were actually investigated another company. And it was uh, quite a uh, coincidence uh, that they recognized that it was a corruption case in uh, Rolls Royce because um, <coughs> when they uh, were um, searching for another company, they saw a man <laughs> deliver a Rolls Royce in a garage and uh, it was a sheik from a foreign country that uh, picked it up and uh, drove away. and. Uh, and this was actually the beginning of the case. So if uh, this had, had uh, have happened, uh, they might not have uh, seen it. So 
So it was quite surprising for SFO because they didn't have any uh, any feeling or any indication that it was corruption in the role. So, so it was um, it was uh, it was just uh, by an accident that I found out. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the office, they said uh, that it was a fair, reasonable and appropriate uh, settlement and uh, the cost um, <clears throat> was total 654 million pounds for uh, um, Rolls-Royce and uh, it was a uh, confiscation of uh, profit for 258 million, which they estimated by uh, in the external uh, investigation. Yeah, they had to pay penalties of 239 million pound and this was after a discount of 50 percent because um, uh, the court uh, said uh, Rolls-Royce might be bankrupt they might not afford to pay the full um, uh, penalties and uh, they also gave discount because uh, Rolls-Royce had been cooperated at, uh, and also it made the change of attitude, uh, so uh, so this was a rather big uh, big discount they, they got. And they also had to pay the cost uh, incurred by SFO uh, because this was recovered by by the company. And further, they had a settlement in the United States and Brazil, so this was quite uh, quite costly for uh, for Rolls Royce uh, total. Uh, next, please. Yeah, we have a quick poll. And um, uh, how many years do you think Rolls Royce need to rebuild the same reputation they had before the corruption scandal? Uh, one less than five years, two between five and ten years, uh, three more than ten years. So we just give it a few uh, few seconds so the panelists can uh, come out. <laughs> okay, the result was that uh, the poll was 50% said less than five years, 25% uh, said between five and ten years, and 25% uh, said more than ten years. I'm surprised because uh, my personal uh, opinion was that they would uh, cause a uh, problem for this scandal for more than 10 years, maybe more than 15 or 20, but the majority of you, the most of you said less than five years. And it might be that uh, corporations and people forget because Rolls Royce had the best year ever last year, 2021. So this indicate that they might had uh, people might forgot it or forgive it, but uh, anyway. Yeah, I think uh, I think that uh, the the pu public uh, opinion has a fairly short memory from that perspective. <laughs> uh, so I, I I can sympathize with the people who uh, voted on the on the first answer. Obviously, yeah. there will be other trails around it, but if uh, if people really clean up the management and uh, and and sort of put put in place a new culture um, of of compliance i guess then uh, you can you can make a lot of uh, bad yeah. things from the past go away in a relatively short uh, time although five years is still five years so yes yes i i agree with you and uh, it's uh probably people are probably forgetting and forgiving so uh, so that's uh, that's fair uh, okay next Yeah, the scandal uh, cost uh, Rolls-Royce uh, 654 million in direct cost. And uh, how much do you think the damage on the reputation cost uh, Rolls-Royce? Um, one for less than the direct cost of 655 million, around the same amount as the direct cost, or far more than the direct cost? Uh, are you then, uh, are, Knut, are you talking about uh, loss of market value uh, on yes, the shares of Rolls-Royce? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was talking about uh, loss of reputation and the total cost of uh, loss, losing share price um, 
lost reputation for many years, loss of, loss of sales, etc. So um, the total, uh, total cost. Okay, uh, and the result is that uh, non zero percenting for uh, less than the direct cost. That's quite interesting. Uh, around the same uh, as the direct cost on 655 million. 67% voted for uh, this uh, this amount, and 33% uh, voted for far more than the direct cost. So this means that uh, corrupt uh, case in uh, corruption case in Rolls Royce uh, maybe cost them uh, 650 million twice, or even far more than that. So that was quite costly, and it could be a game over for uh, for uh, for the company. Okay, next. And also, uh, the, the authority said that uh, none of the expenses that they had to pay was um, could be a reduction on the tax bill. So uh, all the expenses was non-deductible, which also is a quite uh, quite uh, important issues uh, for Rolls Royce. Um, and of course. The bribery was not uh, non was also non deductible. Next, please. And uh, we mentioned uh, in the beginning the link between anti corruption and tax compliance, and it has been a few studies. And uh, for example, a study from China said that uh, it is a significant negative correlation on between corruption and tax compliance. Uh, the less corruption, the higher the taxes. And uh, as I said, I, I haven't seen any cases where the company have been fully tax compliant if they have uh, been involved in a corruption case. Uh, because a corruption case normally means um, uh, tax evasion, uh, wrongful uh, accounting, reporting, etc. So, uh, but it might be uh, the situation that some companies have uh, achieved to being uh, compliance, but um, I think that's a seldom, a seldom issue. Uh, next, please. And uh, the question is uh, whether the Rolls Royce corruption uh, corruption scandal could have been avoided, and I think it could have been with um, a better culture in the company, with the training, with the risk assessment on uh, anti corruptions, uh, on with an internal uh, management system, uh, with. Um, uh, routines for uh, reporting non-conformities and uh, continual improvement. And uh, I also think uh, that uh, with um, the ISO 37001 on anti-corruption, uh, I believe the company would uh, have avoided the, the, the scandal. And also, if uh, they had had ISO 37001, on uh, anti-corruption or perhaps 9001 on uh, taxation, they would probably not have any penalties even if uh, corruption had occurred. Because this is the opinion from many authorities. If you have a good management system, you have good training, culture, etc., it might be corruption. But if you have done whatever you can, they won't pen penalize you. So, so this is a possibility to avoid the corruptions and also to be perhaps more tax compliance in such cases. Uh, next, please. Okay. Yeah, That's, yeah I think uh, uh, the, the last slide, Knut, uh, was uh, uh, Rolls Royce a, a risk of, of game over, I believe, Ed. So the, yes. the, that was uh, what uh, the point you've been making. This would have had a big impact in on Rolls Royce if the 50% discount would not have happened. You explained to me. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, yes, that that's the point, and also that uh, all the whole case with uh, all the direct cost with the with the loss of uh, uh, reputation with the penalties uh, that could have been game over for. Um, 
<coughs> for Rolls Royce, and uh, I think it's important case to take learning from because this is uh, this might have uh, caused uh, the end of Rolls Royce. Uh, more than 100 years uh, history so um, so that's the point uh, yes you are right okay, okay. okay. thanks Thank very you. much this uh, this is great um shall we shall we move to you albert uh, on the Mozambique case yeah thank you uh, uh, steve well my name is uh, albert uh, bomer and I'm a professor of text and technology at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and at the Tilburg University. Uh, and one of the topics I focus on is how to use technology uh, for tax compliance, um, for tax assurance issues. Um, earlier, uh, a few years ago, until a few years ago, I also work at uh, the Dutch tax authorities. Um, and I focus mainly on technology, assurance, and of course, uh, tax. Um, I would like to say something about the Mozambique uh, case. Uh, the, the central uh, theme in this case study is uh, the importance of being in control. I think this case is a good illustration uh, of what can go uh, wrong consequences. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. Uh, it is a case that has uh, been running for some time uh, and it is far from uh, being over. Uh, much uh, has been published about this case uh, that make it easy uh, to reconstruct uh, the course of events. Uh, I will base uh, myself on what has been published in the news and especially on what the Department of Justice in the United States has published. And that is a lot. Uh, in this case, at least two parties are acting. Firstly, Credit Suisse, with entities in the United Kingdom and uh, the, uh, the US. And uh, a company set up uh, by the state of Mozambique. However, as we shall see, the consequences uh, go beyond these uh, parties. Uh, next uh, uh, sheet, uh, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is it about? Uh, what was uh, the intention uh, at the beginning? Uh, the state of Mozambique uh, wanted to start a uh, tuna fishery, a modern fleet that would be able to compete internationally uh, and so to stimulate uh, the economy. Uh, it set up an entity uh, that issued loans to finance uh, the whole project. Uh, international finances could uh, participate by means of uh, bonds. And in the end, the amount was uh, 2 billion of loans. Uh, Credit Suisse arranged uh, the loans. Well, so far, so good. However, next slide, uh, please. Uh, okay. Um, well, it was uh, not clear when the when, where the money uh, went. Some has disappeared. A huge amount uh, disappeared. Uh, there was also a discussion with the IMF about the repayment of an earlier loan. Uh, Mozambique was less credit worthy. Uh, and the fishing boats that were built turned out to be worthless. They were not uh, able for fishing far out uh, at sea. So there was, in fact, they were useless. Uh, and to make all this possible, uh, 200 million in kickbacks uh, have been paid to government uh, officials and uh, Credit Suisse uh, employees. And all this was kept secret for the investors for as long as possible. Next sheet, uh, please. Okay. Um, 
what is circulate uh, Swiss uh, accused of uh, in this case? First, uh, firstly, aware uh, of the fact that the money were not only used for the tuna fishing uh, and knowledge of the poor uh, condition of the boats. Uh, of course, and there were kickback fees paid to employees of Credit uh, Suisse and hiding everything uh, for uh, the investors. Uh, well, they had knowledge about what happened without any consequences. They didn't take any actions uh, to stop to stop the whole uh, whole uh, fall. Uh, Credit uh, yeah, Suisse tried to hide everything as long as possible uh, until until the three employees confessed uh, to taking bribes, uh, and that was the turning point in this uh, case. Yeah, that was the turning point. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Um, well, what are the consequences uh, for for Credit uh, Suisse? Uh, they have agreed a cross-border settlement with the Justice Department, Department of Justice. Uh, however, this is not uh, a final solution. Procedures are still uh, ongoing in the United Kingdom. Investors are not satisfied about uh, the outcomes. Uh, they want more compensation. Uh, in the settlement, they agreed to pay uh, 575 million to the Department of Justice, and that are an amount consists of, of fines and com compensation to um, uh, an, 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 an official compensation to the investors. Uh, and there is an agreement on the calculation method to use for the compensation to the investors. But that is not uh, the end. Uh, there are follow up procedures in the United Kingdom, also follow up investigations by the Security Exchange Committee. The commission and tax authorities. Uh, tax authorities are also uh, looking uh, to this uh, case. Um, and as a consequence, uh, a dramatic drop in the share uh, price. Uh, and this is not uh, over yet. Want the first uh, court hearings in the United Kingdom are scheduled in 2023. So this will be in the newspapers for a long time with continuing damage to the reputation uh, as a result. Um, oh, Albert, was, uh, uh, yes? Albert uh, the same question as I phrased to Knut, uh, uh, how did the, um, in this case, the US uh, Department of Justice uh, got a hold of, uh, of, of this case? So what forensic accounting techniques did they use or was it uh, a little bit uh, similar to the Rolls Royce case where coincidentally well, they found out about it? Well, it was not very sophisticated uh, uh, analytic uh, techniques. Uh, there was a confession. Uh, the three, the three uh, highly ranked uh, employees confessed. That was, that was a turning point. Uh, and uh, they also get access to emails. Uh, they get access to, uh, to and they, they also uh, they listen to the, to the cell phones. Uh, and they detect that they use uh, code language. Uh, for instance, if they use the word uh, wine bottles, they knew that it was about uh, kickback. Uh, uh, fees. So uh, they use uh, well, uh, well, not does not not. It is advanced technique uh, to get access to, to emails and, and and cell phones, but uh, it was not very sophisticated uh, techniques. That that was that was the, 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 the start point of this whole investigation. And, uh, and you ask also what was the what what how this does. Uh, what was what was the beginning? Well, if you look at the whole setup, uh, it is it, it it is almost impossible that it uh, will uh, will hold because uh, at the end you have to pay back the investors, and if the money is disappeared, then there is a there is a moment in time that you have a problem. Okay, so that was the starting. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, okay, so there the, the will be, uh, I, I think the whole, the whole, this whole fraud, the, the, the whole project, the whole damage in the news for to 
the uh, Canon Swiss, I, I think it will be more than 10 years uh, that you can expect. Uh, there is one other aspect that also has been agreed upon, uh, namely internal control. That is also part of the settlement. Uh, I will come back to that later uh, because this is, I think, a special and important uh, aspect of this uh, case. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Yes. Uh, well, of course, there are also uh, uh, implications uh, for other parties. Uh, the IMF has cut off Mozambique from uh, funds. Uh, it is difficult uh, for Mozambique to borrow money on the international uh, capital market. Uh, and this has a big effect on the economy. It is est uh, estimated that a whole year of gross domestic product has been lost of this. Uh, and of course, the investors uh, lost a lot of money, but that is uh, maybe uh, coming back uh, in part. Uh, TMF, uh, there are also consequences for TMF. And TMF is a Dutch company that provided management service to the Mozambican uh, entity. Uh, and TMF has had failed to comply with a series uh, of regulations, such as checking up of the customer. It thereby neglected its so-called gatekeeper function that financial service providers have. Uh, and TFF uh, has to pay a fine of a half million euro. And of course, there are also uh, consequences for the fishing boat uh, manufacturers. Manufacturers, they are also uh, in the picture. Uh, okay, several parties bear uh, the consequences, uh, but let us focus on Credit uh, Suisse. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, of, of, well, if, uh, of importance in this case is, um, uh, is that um, Mozambique, uh, credit, that Credit Suisse uh, could have been seen uh, this coming. There were sufficient warnings. Uh, the whole project was full of uh, red flags. First of all, they knew that Mozambique had payment problems before. Uh, they had a report of the lower value of the fishing boat. They received signals from the boat builder uh, that there were uh, corruption. Uh, and they had signals that the money was being used for something else. Uh, there were reports uh, of external advisors uh, about that. And all these signals did not result in an intervention or a stop or a warning to the investors. Uh, after the confession of the three employees, Credit Suisse made a turn. And that was to say that it was entirely due to these three employees, caused by the three employees acting against the internal rules of the company. Uh, but the, the US attorney's office uh, they stated that the three bankers acted with the scope of their employment and that they intended, at least uh, for part, to benefit uh, the bank. And that is enough uh, to find the company liable to the action, uh, actions of its uh, employees. So it doesn't work uh, this defense uh, line. Okay, next uh, sheet, please. Okay, well, there is a remarkable uh, uh, part in settlement uh, documents. Uh, you can look that up on the internet. It is all published on the internet uh, by the Department of Justice uh, in the United States. Um, Credit Suisse has namely uh, to strengthen its internal control. That is part of the, sec of the settlement. And Credit Suisse must come up with proposals on how it will strengthen the internal control to prevent fraud. So there are also quarterly meetings with the Department of Justice to discuss pro the progress. Uh, and uh, they have also to show test uh, that Credit Suisse has carried out uh, um, well all kind, kind of uh, measurements uh, to strengthen uh, of the internal controls. Um, 
So there is an agreement uh, on internal controls. The test must also set up to show progress. There must also be established a monitoring function to test the functioning of the internal controls. Um, okay, ne next uh, slide, uh, please. Well, why is this uh, so uh, special? Uh, well, this is not the first accounting scandal. There are uh, the last 30 years a lot of scandals, uh, Enron, etc. Uh, almost each year there is an accounting scandal. And you see that when an accounting scandal occurs, the rules are tightened. You see also uh, that risk mo uh, management models, they are also changed. Uh, they are uh, so uh, getting more complex. For example, the so-called uh, COSO model. Uh, no intention of discussing uh, this model in detail. And that is why the picture of it is uh, so small. Uh, but uh, I use it to illustrate uh, that uh, they change this model, they make it more advanced. Uh, Coastal 1992, 2004, and then they changed again in 2030. And we have the Coastal Enterprise Risk uh, um, model. Uh, and that is always a reaction uh, of uh, counting uh, uh, scandal. But in this case, there is a different reaction. Uh, part of the settlement is a plan to improve the internal control and that the Department of Justice. Uh, follow this process. Uh, follow this process if there is an improvement. Uh, I think that is a, a, a different uh, approach. Uh, um, but in this case, uh, but you could well you could say uh, on the end, uh, what that differences does it make? Uh, there were enough warnings. There were plenty of red flags, and there were not acted upon. Uh, and if that is the case, then no internal control system uh, works. Um, next sheet, uh, please. Okay. Uh, but the settlement goes further than that. Uh, the doc document shows show that attention is also paid to the culture uh, that made this possible, including uh, the tone at uh, the top. Well, so far, um, I'll leave it uh, at this uh, at this point. I think that uh, is also uh, that this is also an important aspect for uh, our uh, discussion. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Albert. I think we have a, a, a poll following this. Yes. For the audience to step into. Yeah, what we see while we're waiting for the answers, I, I think uh, there's also the, the recent initiative by the EU to introduce an EU whistleblower act or directive uh, just uh, over Christmas. So there, there's there's more um, there's more and more movement uh, to to get that information uh, reported um, either directly or indirectly to the relevant uh, regulators. And, and uh, in all honesty, well, let's first address the result, Albert. Are you surprised on the, on this response? Um, well, um, I'm, I'm positively uh, surprised because a corruption risk management uh, is very low, zero, uh, zero, uh, and that is, uh, I think, that is all. That, that is one of the things that this case shows. Uh, that you can have a complete that the, the bank sector is uh, highly regulated. Uh, there are a lot of uh, compliance uh, uh, regulations. So you see that all the kind of models that, that well that doesn't prevent uh, this kind of uh, fraud. It is well a change of culture is is I think also uh, important. Uh, and that is what this uh, outcome also shows. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 just uh, a, a question for you, Albert, and, and for you, Knut. 
uh, do you do you believe uh, that, uh, that that since anti-corruption is is a rag tech, uh, regular, uh, regulatory technology area where more and more analytics uh, seems to happen, although the cases at hand we we looked at uh, are are less uh, data driven, uh, forensic accounting data driven uh, analyses. Um, are we are we expecting the tax arena to move in in same similar direction so also to become a rag tech type of environment uh, not too different from the um, anti-corruption antitrust and breach of human rights um yes i i i i i, I think so i think it is an uh, is an end it is uh, a more the total picture they can see that there is more collection of data, more use of data analytic tools, more monitoring, uh, more advanced uh, models. We are already uh, uh, discussed two ISO and, and uh, COSO. Uh, and you see also more focus on culture. That is uh, the tone at the top. The, well, the whole environment that uh, makes it possible. That is also. Uh, in, in ISO and in part of ISO and in part of COSO reflected to them. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I I, I agree. Knut, uh, any final thoughts from, from your end? Is Knut, uh, are you muted? Okay, let's let's uh, see where we can get Knut online again. Uh, I, I think a uh, very interesting uh, presentation, Albert. Thanks and uh, thank you, Knut, as well. Uh, I, I think a few key takeaways: anti-corruption and tax do overlap. I think that's the the, the main conclusion uh, we can draw after this. Uh, the two out of many um, examples uh, uh, Knut and Albert uh, presented. Uh, a very important uh, last on, on the on the poll: anti-corruption is a cultural, even more than an ISO-driven issue or a tax risk management uh, uh, framework type of issue. Um, I, I think if you move into anti-corruption and any tax consequences or, or, of that are typically labeled as tax evasions, almost like pulled along. Um, um, like a fatal attraction into the, the wrong end of tax where you don't want to be. Um, again, get get the relevant data sets and raise the relevant questions to detect to detect such cases. Obviously, if people are very creative, uh, then then those detections will not uh, be easy, uh, even if you act in, in a corporate in-house environment. Uh, although I've seen in the in the way we look at value chains and do data analyt analytics, uh, quite some questions which could be raised uh, not only on tax on transportation but also on the other parts of uh, of the law references we introduced in the beginning. Um, with that, uh, um, Albert and Knut, any final comments? Or I'm looking at Rosanna as well. And uh, is there any final? question raised by the audience not at this stage um, uh, albert any final uh, points knut any final points you want to raise well um you see that uh, tax uh, is not uh, isolated but it is also uh, well, if there are in other fields uh, risks or issues, for instance, well, these two cases uh, show that, that also uh, the, the tax uh, uh, assurance uh, is uh, well, at risk. You see that uh, and also in both cases, there were also uh, tax consequences of this uh, fault. So they are always uh, connected uh, to each other. Um, I have one uh, one final question from uh, Julia uh, from Spain, and and she's asking what what uh, how was the the management impacted on the cases of Rolls Royce and uh, and uh, uh, Credit Suisse? 
Um, Julia, you want to uh, share a few thoughts on that uh, or ask Albert or Knut uh, the, the consequences in the two cases we looked at? Yeah, I would like to ask Knut uh, uh, about that. I don't know if he, he can give any input on this on this matter of the uh, consequences the, for uh, management. On the, on the credit Swiss Yes, the Credit Suisse uh, uh, have a lot of problems. Uh, the, man, the top management uh, has a lot of problems uh, because all, uh, there are more issues uh, now uh, coming up by Credit Suisse. Uh, also, issues uh, connected to uh, the, the, the culture, the tone at the top. Uh, and if the, the, the share price drops dramatically, uh, well, the top management have always a problem, uh, I think. So there are several problems uh, for the top uh, management, uh, and they struggle uh, to survive. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Albert, uh, Julia, for the question, and, and Knut for uh, for your presentation and contribution. We we are uh, right on the on the hour, so thanks very much for uh, joining this first webinar series. There will be another uh, webinar series on uh, on treasury related topics and the use of reference rates and in, uh, in the in the context of transpricing a little bit later this month so please uh, stay tuned and register yourself uh, if if you're interested and for now for now have a nice day and uh, thanks for joining have a nice day uh, thank you